Nine-year-old Renee Furson and her sister were baptized into the Catholic Church with the consent of their parents. Willing to sacrifice their daughter's Jewish identity to ensure their survival, the parents entrusted them to the church, promising to raise them as Catholics if they returned home after the war. In silence, the parents watched the baptism from the back of the church. At the close of the ceremony, their mother burst into tears. Renee remembers her mother crying, I sold you. And she ran out of the church and she ran from us. We didn't belong to her anymore. This marked the beginning of Renee's struggle with her religious and cultural identity. She adopted an identity that promised her security and may very well have saved her life, but the price that she paid was the repression of her former self. Renee, along with thousands of other Jewish children in France during the Holocaust, did not face an entirely new situation. From Moses's family entrusting him to the Egyptians, to the crypto Jews in 15th century Spain, in times of persecution, Jews have hidden their identity in order to survive. However, the circumstances of the Holocaust hidden children who actively negotiated categories of Jewish and Christian for years have largely been overlooked. Because the battlegrounds of identity were located within the children themselves, the memoirs of hidden children provide intimate insights into how ordinary children responded to anti-Semitism during an extraordinary time. As children, many of their responses to persecution were initially determined by parental decision. Where are we going to go into hiding? When, at what point? But when it came to their inner spiritual life, the children demonstrated a remarkable degree of autonomy. And it's this very agency that historians have overlooked. The existing testimonies represent a small fraction of the Jewish children who survived in France. Hidden children only began to define themselves as survivors and to bear witness in the past few decades. Even after the term survivor became widely used in the 1980s in France, it was generally applied only then to people who had been in concentration camps in other countries. A hierarchy of suffering is thus a common theme in their, in their testimonies. So for example, Odette Myers explains in her memoir, I felt that the right responsibility of bearing witness belonged to those camp survivors who were older than I. The International Gathering of Children Hidden During World War II, first held in 1991, has inspired many hidden children to speak out about their wartime experiences. Since 1993, members of Alumim, an Israeli association of hidden child survivors from France, have been publishing their own newsletter, hosting support groups, and sending survivors to share their stories with students. And so through all of these different avenues, Hidden children have expressed their individual identities, their individual stories, but they've also established in some ways a common identity. Over the course of my research, I studied well over a hundred testimonies of children who hid under Catholic identities in France. My goal has been to explore the ways that children understood their identity before, during, and after the war. In short, hidden children experienced a splitting of identities because of their dual religious affinities that they developed. As the children struggled to reconcile their past Jewish identities with their new Catholic ones, many of them experienced a crisis of self-understanding. And that was hard enough during the war, but then this was also exacerbated after the war when they returned to Jewish communities. And for, for many of those, that was a very foreign experience, which I'll talk about later. So by actively exploring in the categories of what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be Catholic, these children unknowingly to themselves were participating in a historic process. A new generation of hidden Jews was born and they were faced with a challenge to be a Catholic on the streets, in school, in church, at home, and a Jew in memory only. The children had juggled multiple identities before the war. Before the war, they had learned to be Jewish at home and to be French in public so that they would be accepted by their classmates. Even some of the younger children expressed an awareness of the flexibilities of religious categories. 
So for example, when in hiding, eight-year-old Claude Morhang Begay felt ambivalence towards the weekly mass that he, he attended, um, saying, I say my prayers, I don't mind doing it at all. Has any of that anything really to do with me? In this period, I also learned about the relativity and flexibility of manners and customs. Hidden children such as Claude were unknowingly participating in what Israeli philosopher Yirmiyahu Yovel understands as a rich tradition, the tradition of crypto-Judaism, of negotiating categories of Christian and Jewish to determine public and private behavior. Throughout much of history, the concealment of Judaism was linked to survival. However, hidden children in World War II faced significant disadvantages. In other periods of history, the secrecy of Judaism played a large role in familial and social life of crypto Jews. So it might not have been possible to celebrate a holiday in a synagogue, but it was possible to observe Shabbat within your home with your family. But for hidden children of the Holocaust, they were cut off from the rest of the Jewish community. And younger children in particular might have had no memory of Jewish practices. So without communal support, their hold on Judaism was tenuous at best. Now, before I launch um, really into the particulars of their testimonies, I wanna um, just do a very, very quick um, overview of, of, of demography to, to provide a quick context for us. So Jews on the Fran and in France on the eve of World War II, we're talking about in total about 70,000 French Jews in all French ruled territory. So that includes um, North Africa. Um, but of those 300,000 specifically are living in metropolitan France. In addition, we have 30 to 40,000 Jewish refugees who have arrived in France by 1939 from other countries who have been escaping Nazi persecution. And despite the years of roundups and deportations through the efforts of numerous organizations, 75% of Jews who had been living in France in 1939 survived the Holocaust. And among the survivors are children who spent the war years within France, either under assumed Christian identities um, or physically hiding, like physically concealed um, in non-Jewish homes. Children's ability to assimilate into Catholic society more easily than their parents may help to explain their relatively higher survival rate. Since they constitute the largest group of survivors, a study of their memoirs reveals the practical and emotional difficulties that they faced. Now, pre-war, Jewish children raised in secular homes often understood Judaism in relatively ambiguous terms. In some ways, even before the war, these children had been taught that Jewishness was something to be expressed in private, not publicly in French society. And their parents themselves were also struggling to reconcile religious and secular worlds. And all of this helped to shape children's identity. Isaac Lavendel notes, having already broken away from the or orthodox interpretation of Jewish religion before they left the Polish shtetl, my parents were awkwardly striving to behave like the French. Inside, however, they remained ferociously Jewish. As a result of synthesizing the religious and the secular and the cultural, many French Jews thought of Judaism as a culture, part of their family's heritage. Um, and I think this, this, this quote really aptly sums up how complicated of a process this was for Jewish adults in France and how complex that was to pass it on to their children. Um, so we see, for example, Jacqueline Glickenstein recalls that while her father had given up on organized religion, he also taught his children to be proud of their heritage, that the only way to fight discrimination was to assimilate, to assimilate, but, but to be, continue to be proud of their identity. And this added, these attitudes of their parents left the children with a pretty complex legacy. Many children from more assimilated homes carried into the war a vague understanding of Judaism that was expressed through fragmented memories. In addition, while Judaism was a private religion, Catholicism in France was a public religion pervading French culture and society and art and architecture. 
So we have a situation where the least observant Jewish children may have known nothing about Judaism, but Catholicism would not have been entirely foreign to them at the beginning of the war. So with this legacy, they enter World War II. In May 1940, the Nazis launched, launched their offense on France. And at this moment- I can't, I can't hear you. Can other people hear me? Yes, I can hear I'm you. I'm sorry, that was no yes, present. Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so at this moment, we have about 350,000 Jews living in France, many of whom remember- I also have French trouble hearing, a little bit loud. We're not French citizens. In June, after the conclusion of the Battle of France and with the signing of an armistice, France was divided into two zones. Um, the German army occupied, occupied the northern and western France where most French Jews were living. And then until 1942, the southern and the eastern regions of France remained unoccupied, but governed by a French collaborationist government. In both regions, Jews, particularly those who did not have French citizenship, were targeted for persecution and internment. The most significant piece of anti-Semitic legislation that impacted Jewish children, though the first most significant one, happened in the Northern Zone on June 7, 1942, when Jews over the age of six were required to wear a yellow star on their outer clothing. And the suddenness of this label was very alarming for many of the children. Renee Roth recalls, I went to bed one night as an ordinary eight-year-old and I woke up the next day as a Jew. For Sarah Gross, the mandate to wear the star marked the end of innocence. It triggered anti-Semitism from, from, from classmates who had previously been kind. She writes, because I wore a star, even though I was the same Sarah, someone had taunted me as a dirty Jewess. From that day on, my small happy world was gone. The reactions of friends and teachers to this branding had devastating effects upon their self-esteem. The star was particularly frustrating for children who had never thought of themselves as Jewish or didn't even know that they were Jewish. Jewish jo jo Joseph Yafo writes, all of a sudden they stick a few square inches of cloth on me and I turn into a Jew. What does that mean? What the hell is a Jew? I feel anger rising up in me along with a helpless rage of not understanding. Wearing the star also created an enormous sense of vulnerability. Before Renee Roth left her home each morning for school, she counted her remaining moments of privacy. I am ashamed. I no longer walk. I skim the walls. Testimonies such as Isaac Levendell's emphasize a fierce desire to disappear. In his memoir, he, requ he recalls wishing that the earth would swallow him up on the playground when his classmates turned on him. The fact that they had seen the Jewish stamp on his food rationing card made it impossible for him to deny his Jewishness. Nevertheless, many of these children did hide their Jewish identities even before they formally adopted new Christian ones. So Simon Jeruchim considers his Jewishness to be a shameful secret to be hidden from his friends. And he writes in his memoir about trying to position his scarf just so, so that it would hide his star on his way to school. So the public stigmatization coupled with changing dynamics at home and at school meant that these children no longer had a safe haven. They could no longer trust friends and teachers. They lost confidence in their identity as Jews and the war led them to associate Judaism as something to be hidden to prevent discrimination. And if no safe haven could be found as a Jew, a new identity would have to be forged in order to remain secure. One month after the mandate to wear the yellow star in the Northern zone, French Jewry reached its crisis point. French police arrested 13,000 Jews in the occupied zone. Up to this point, Jewish men had been the main targets. Now the police were acting indiscriminately. And of the 8,000 Jews, for example, who were detained at the Velodrome d'Hiver in Paris this summer, half of them were children who would be brutally separated from their parents and deported to Auschwitz alone. The public violence of this summer sent an alarm through Jewish communities in France. 
and relief societies worked feverishly to smuggle youths out of camps. By mid-1943, a network of volunteers had placed well over a thousand children within Christian schools and orphanages, and farmers were also enlisted to help shelter these children. When the children went into hiding by adopting Christian identities, their names were the first things to be changed. And there were mixed reactions to, to this, as we, as we see here. Five-year-old Josie Martin asked her parents, I won't be me anymore. Claudine Vey worried that if she changed her name, her parents wouldn't be able to find her when the war ended. She writes, I wanted to keep my name. I was going to grow and change. What if they didn't recognize me? Conversely, Renee Roth welcomed the name change. I don't like what's happening to me. I'm ashamed of my name. I've been feeling ashamed of many things, of not being like everybody else. Her new name brought relief. Suppressing identity went hand in hand with the new names. The children had to replace their own past with a fabricated history, and they couldn't talk about the people and experiences that had formed their identity up until this point. Ruth Hartz explains, there had been constant reminders that I was a Jewish child, the roundups, the suspicious looks, the fear. Now all of that had been erased. I was not Jewish. I was going to be protected by a lie. Thoughts of their past lives remained even as they strove to live within the framework of their new identities. Despite carefully hiding her past, Panina Spitz unconsciously betrayed herself. I guess it was the constant stress that pushed me one day while I was doing my homework to take a piece of paper and to draw a yellow star with the word Jew right in the middle. Maybe it was to remind me of who I really was. Once safely ensconced in boarding schools, orphanages, and families, hidden children ex express both an intense attraction to Catholicism, as well as a need to cling to fragments of Judaism. The majority of the memoirs evoke conflicted loyalties. Catholicism is providing comfort and security. Judaism is providing a link to their absent families. And these two needs to protect yourself with a safer religion and to maintain ties with your familiar past exacerbated the children's search for their identity. Even as they embraced Christian, Christian identities, fears kept the children loyal to their Jewish heritage. So for example, Catholicism's emphasis upon sin made many of these children very uncomfortable. Josie Martin writes, the rules of going to heaven, hell, or limbo baffled me. When Renee first and began to doubt some of the teachings of the church, she realized that by doubting, she was committing a sin according to the church. Posing as Christians induced guilt. Several survivors mentioned that they expected to be struck by lightning when they took communion, for example. Jacqueline Glickenstein worried that her parents would think less of her for pretending to be a Catholic. When Renee Roth was assigned the role of Judas in the pageant of the Last Supper at her school, she feared that the children would realize that she was Jewish and would call her a traitor since she was passing as a Catholic. All of the children though, tried to cling to some aspect of their Jewishness, primarily because it connected them with their parents. Before their separation, some parents imparted biblical stories to help their children remember their heritage. Saul Friedlander, for example, recalls his father, and this was a man who had ceased observing Jewish holidays long before the Nazi invasion, telling him the story of Hanukkah. And reflecting on this moment, Friedlander writes in his memoir, when crises occur, one searches the depths of one's memory to discover some vestige of the past, not that of the individual, but that instead of the community, which though left behind, nevertheless represents that which is permanent and lasting. As parents searched the past for something to give their children, the children accepted these stories and repeated them to themselves. Before being sent to a convent, Ruth Hartz's parents urged her, remember that you are Jewish. Don't speak of it to anyone, but never forget it. Be proud of it as Queen Esther was. While Ruth remembered this, the story that her father told her of Ruth and Naomi had more meaning since she shared the matriarch's name. 
Each night Hertz would address her absent parents using the words that Ruth spoke to Naomi. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people and you are God, my God. And this passage she, she, she recalls brought her great strength. But not all of the children were armed with such stories. Renee Roth grappled to find some Jewish prayer or story in the recesses of her memory to help her fight Christian indoctrination and found that she couldn't remember any. Over time, the children began to appreciate the haven that the Catholic Church provided. For Renee Roth, singing made her feel like she belonged, that there was hope coming from her heart. Hymns and the predictability of life dominated by ritual brought solace. Many children spent time praying for their families. Frankie Paper, for example, recalls hanging pictures of Jesus and praying that he would reunite her with her parents. With so much uncertainty, the church was a place where simplicity reigned. As Friedlanda reflected, straightforward faith, which was inculcated into us, this was what I needed. Was not literal Christianity directed, first of all, to the disinherited and to the abandoned of the world? The children also sought comfort from tangible things in the church. Martin, Josie Martin, felt safe surrounded by crucifixes, so safe that she made her parents a paper cross and mailed it to them so that they could be protected as well. Statues of saints became confidants in a world where talking to people could cost children their lives. Renee Furson recalls, after mass, I would go to St. Francis. I would tell him everything. He was made of stone, but he could hear every word and he would never tell anyone. The Virgin Mary in particular played the most significant role. Renee Roth appreciated the importance of women in Catholicism, and she found it easier to talk to Mary than to God, who she believed had been quote unquote, lousy to the Jews. For many children, the Virgin reminded them of their mother. Odette Myers wrote, when everything is gray inside, I like to sit by the Virgin. She is a mother and she must surely understand. Odette associated the Virgin Mary with Madame Marie, her godmother, who was responsible for helping her to find a hiding place. Odette was delighted upon learning that Madame Marie was the peasant's term of affection for the Virgin Mary. Before the war, Odette had respected the wisdom of her, grandma, of her godmother. Now, far from home, she discovered a surrogate godmother in the Holy Mother. She wrote, Madame Marie was with me. She was in the church. She was in every statue, every picture of the Virgin Mary. She would take care of me. At Friedlander's baptism, he received the name Marie. For him, this was an invocation of the protection of the Virgin the heavenly mother who sheltered me from the storm, less vulnerable than my earthly mother, who at that very moment had been carried away by the whirlwind. The price that the children paid for the solace of Christianity was an increasing distance from their own heritage. During her third month in the convent, Josie Martin's father was able to come for a visit. After watching his daughter gather a bouquet to place at the foot of a cross, he lamented, She's already becoming a little Catholic. Josie recognized that she was quote unquote, not their little girl anymore. When Ruth Hartz miss, missed her own parents and feared that they were dead, the nuns assured her that quote, we had a new family, our brothers and sisters in Jesus. Renee Roth feared that she was betraying her parents, but she felt powerless to stop the influence of the church. Her love of the church created a moral dilemma. She writes, how can you adopt a new family without betraying the old one? As the children's memories of Judaism grew dim, they began to turn against their religion of Judaism. Jacqueline Glickenstein, quote, started to think that perhaps Jews were bad. Otherwise, why would God allow anyone to persecute them? Ruth Hartz mirrored this thought. It would be better if we could forget altogether about being Jewish. Jewish people got into trouble and were taken away. If Haman had tried to get rid of the Jews and now the Nazis had the same intention, there must be something wrong with being Jewish. Faced with the dichotomy that was presented to her by one teacher of Christians as holy and Jews as evil, 
Odette Myers worried that the messages of the sermons that she was hearing were true, that Jews were, quote, in a league with Satan, and that he was using us to hurt true Christians. Isabel Riff, unable to distance herself from the guilt of being Jewish, was aware that something was quote unquote wrong and had to be hidden. This is a terrible feeling, she explains, to be aware that you, that what you are is a reason that you have to hide it. It is to feel ashamed for who you are. Attachment to Catholicism was thus facilitated by the fact that participating in a safe identity was a survival mechanism and a way to attempt to overcome what philosopher Jacques Derrida calls the mal de l'appartenance or, or a pain or a discomfort of belonging. Rather than simply deny their Jewishness, it was more constructive for the children to use their relationship with the church to create a new identity. They began by adopting new names and learning prayers, but over time they became very enmeshed in their new environments. The children were moved from one institution to another in many cases, so it's not as though they were hidden in the same convent typically during the entire war. R uh, rather, they rarely stayed in one place long enough to establish lasting friendships. However, religion was portable. It was part of a newly forged identity framework that could be used throughout the war, no matter where they lived. Many children experienced intense periods during which they felt extremely close to the church and wanted it to be a permanent part of their lives. Frida Weinstein was furious when her mother refused to let her be baptized, writing, it's not my mother's business, it's my soul, but she's no longer my mother. I want to be a daughter of the church. Should her mother not return, Frida comforted herself that the church would offer her a replacement family. Josie Martin was alarmed that she needed her family's permission in order to be baptized, writing, you have to have papers before Jesus can enter your heart. She begged the nuns to write to her parents and ask them to send her a white dress for Holy Communion. Renee Roth was totally committed to becoming a nun after God protected her during the D-Day invasion. Friedlander explains that he had, quote unquote, passed over to Catholicism, body and soul. While one child, Ava, had wanted to become a rabbi's wife before the war, her wartime religious experience was so profound that she asked to be baptized in 1944, explaining, to my anguished questions, Christ alone was able to respond. Christianity represents to me the only solution for peace and universal harmony. I thought that the Christian ideal of the union of men and God was superior to that of the Jews. After the war, Ava slowly found her way back to Judaism, but her intense identification with Christianity remains striking. The immediate post-war years brought with them their own scent of struggles. Jacqueline Glickenstein writes that, quote, the four years following the war were more destructive to our emotional well-being than all of our years in hiding. During their years of separation, children and parents had become strangers. Orphan children were shuffled between orphanages and foster homes. Odette Myers felt that her parents expected her to fulfill one duty, to get back to normal. But she says, for those who are too young to remember much of normal times, it's hard to figure out what it all means. In the rush to regain normalcy, adults did not encourage children to talk about their experiences. As Charles Zellwer reflected, when other children had been burned, had been killed, when so many people had died, how could we consider our personal problems? Instead, the children were expected to shed the identity that they had carried through the war and resume their place in the Jewish communities. The children, however, doubted that the war's end meant that they would be safe to live as Jews, and they saw another option, to continue concealing their Jewish identity under Catholicism. In a variety of ways, the children remained in hiding. Despite the fact that the story of her biblical namesake brought her comfort during the war, Ruth Hartz wanted to, to, to keep her Christian name, Renee, after the war because she feared renewed discrimination. Isaac Levendell took his cue from his father who resumed attending synagogue but hid his prayer book in a bag on the way to shul. He writes, 
My Jewishness was becoming a burden. I felt pressed to carry it in a brown paper bag as my father did on his way to the synagogue. Being Jewish was one more thing I would have to keep to myself. Thus, for hidden children, the need to suppress their Jewishness was an extension of what they had practiced during the war. When faced with challenges to one's identity, the children used what they knew about Catholicism and Catholic culture to create a safe framework for themselves after the war. The children not only hid their Jewishness from the world, they also shielded their Catholicism from their parents and their caregivers. Odette Myers learned to internalize her Catholicism, writing, my soul was a castle with many rooms. It was fully portable and conveniently invisible. Therefore, the highest degree of privacy was guaranteed. I could hide all my treasures in those rooms. When the children returned to their families, they sensed that their parents did not approve of their prayers to Jesus. Ruth Hartz explained, I knew that I must not forget my Holy Father in heaven, yet I felt strange praying the rosary in front of my parents. There was no crucifix on the wall to look at as I prayed. My own parents looked away. They did not understand and I did not know how to explain. Even the youngest child survivors who had grown up in a Catholic milieu and who felt like foreigners in the Jewish community learned to internalize their love of Catholicism so that they would not upset their families. They hid rosaries and prayer books under mattresses. Older children continued to go to church, leaving very early in the morning before their families awoke. Renee Roth and her sisters attended mass for five years after the war, driven by an inner conviction that the church was still their home. Others sought the Virgin Mary when they were feeling troubled. Josie Martin writes that after a while, her Jewish identity, quote, was forged, except for secret church visits to see the Virgin Mary. Kneeling before her, I would stare in confused darkness and deep isolation, rushing out of the church almost as soon as I came. Interactions with other Jews facilitated the children's return to Judaism. Relief organizations retrieved children from Christian institutions and returned them to a Jewish milieu. In cases where the children's parents had not survived, they were placed in orphanages where they studied Hebrew, attended services, and some for the first time became well-versed in Jewish culture. These homes allowed the children to explore their heritage in a safe environment, surrounded by peers who were in the same situation. Renee Furson began talking about her wartime experiences with the other children, saying, I felt I belonged. I knew what they wanted, for us to be what we had been before, to send us to Palestine, to build a new nation, to forget the nightmares. Slowly, as time went on, I understood and I was grateful. Parentless children living in Jewish institutions after the war enjoyed a safer environment because the commonality of their experiences in hiding prevented a creation of a hierarchy of suffering, which in many cases proved to be a painful point of contention between hidden children and their parents who returned from concentration camps. Simon Jerochim's time in a Jewish orphanage gave him space and time to reconnect with his heritage. An artist, he was asked by the school's director to decorate the walls of the cafeteria with Hebrew letters. And the project really had a profound impact on him. All along, I had been trying to distance myself from a foreign culture in which I felt I had no part. This was the first time I felt a sense of pride in being Jewish. I wondered whether a mysterious link connected those Hebrew words with my parents' past and the wor world of their ancestors in Poland. While he admits that his reconnection with Judaism had little to do with God or religion, but rather to with the need to come to terms with a Jewish identity that he had worked so hard to keep hidden. He studied for his bar mitzvah, and after the ceremony, he writes that he finally felt a sense of belonging. While this encounter with Hebrew letters did not transform him into an observant Jew, it did serve to meaningfully connect him with his heritage. Jewish youth groups and summer camps also helped to develop a sense of camaraderie. Ruth Hartz recalls that her mother, quote, wanted me to learn about my religion and not be afraid of it. She was enrolled in a Jewish scouting movement. All of her friends were now Jewish and whatever she did was with the Jewish community. 
As she attended Hebrew school and celebrated the establishment of the state of Israel, Josie Martin transferred her loyalties to Judaism. And she says, quote, my Catholic ways were slowly forgotten. Many children have positive memories of Jewish summer camps. Those organized by the Oze were run by people who understood the children's past and the atmosphere was remembered as friendly and warm. And so their connection or their reconnection rather with Judaism among peers was much less isolating than the forging of a Catholic identity that happened during the war that they had had to struggle with in relative solitude. One of the strongest forces that influenced children to abandon Catholicism was a sense of duty that they felt toward the dead. The Jewish communities expected the children to embody the renewal of Judaism. For Jacqueline Glichenstein, family friends reproached her when she started dating a Catholic man post-war. Quote, I was practically accused of committing some sort of religious treason. How could I even think of marrying a Catholic when Christians had killed my parents? Family friends cautioned her that her parents would have been distraught if she married a Catholic. She writes, the last thing I wanted to do was to displease my parents. She eventually broke off her engagement, having internalized the pressure from her parents' friends. Saul Freelander planned to become a priest at the end of the war. However, upon hearing that his parents were murdered in Auschwitz, he began to define himself as a Jew, even though he wasn't really sure what that meant. For the first time, he writes, I felt myself to be Jewish. No longer despite myself, no longer despite myself or secretly, but through a movement of full acceptance. Of Judaism, I knew nothing and I was still a Catholic, but something changed. A bond was reestablished and identity was emerging, confused certainly, but henceforth connected to a central axis of which there could be no doubt. In one manner or another, I was Jewish, whatever this term meant in my mind. The priest who explained his parents' fate to Friedlander encouraged him to consider carefully his future in terms of religion. While their discussions did not immediately change Friedlander's mind for quite some time, he did want to become a priest. The respect with which the priest spoke of his parents allowed Friedlander to realize the right to judge for himself. A powerful encounter with a camp survivor made Odette Myers recognize a responsibility to her fellow Jews. While attending a ceremony for Francis Shoah victims in 1946, a woman approached Odette and suddenly fiercely embraced her. Here is this strange woman hugging me as if she lost me and found me again. In pain and joy, she cries over and over, I had a daughter like you. I am so overwhelmed by her physical appearance. It's as if all Jewish mothers mourning a child embraced me at once. Myers writes, I was every Jewish daughter killed in the mass slaughter of innocence. She was every Jewish mother orphaned from her daughter. I was a child of history. True, I belonged to my blood mother, but all that was secondary. I knew now that I was baptized into a new life that first of all, I belong to the family of my people, the dead we were burying as well as the living. Months later, when a Jewish classmate suggested that they pose as Catholic so that their teachers would not discriminate against them, Myers was tempted. However, thoughts of the ceremony made her hesitate. She couldn't hide her Jewishness anymore. Could I forget that woman who had hugged me during the mass funeral procession? transfusing me with a puzzling identity from which no cross could protect me. And I'd like to close um, with one more story that in some ways parallels and then in other ways um, diverges significantly from the story with which I opened. On August 21st, 1940, 14 year old Aaron Dove was baptized into the Catholic church without the blessing of his parents. Born to Polish parents who had immigrated to France, Aaron found physical and spiritual shelter in a Catholic school. While his father and sister survived, his mother was killed in Auschwitz. As an adult, Aaron made a yearly pilgrimage to the site of her murder to say Kaddish. Until his own death, Aaron remembered the Yiddish of his childhood and signed his name in Hebrew. 
In many ways, his story mirrors that of Rene Furson, which I related at the beginning. However, unlike other hidden children who returned to Judaism, Aaron received his ordination into the priesthood in 1954 and acted as Archbishop of Paris for over a decade. Today, he is known as Jean-Marie Lustiger, the only Catholic prelate in modern times to be born Jewish. Aaron's story is novel, is, is not novel, but he is the most public survivor who retained formal ties with Catholicism. There are other former hidden children who openly embrace Catholicism, but they have chosen not to speak about their decision, perhaps because their dual identity causes unease among the Jewish community. Aaron's position among Jews is ambiguous at best. International Jewish leaders worried that he would become an advocate for apostasy when he announced in one of his first interviews after becoming archbishop that Judaism, quote, found its fulfillment in welcoming the person of Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. It was in recognizing him that Judaism found its meaning for me. He explained that becoming a Christian was for him quote unquote, a better way of being Jewish. Fellow hidden child Abraham Foxman protested when he received an award for his work to advance Catholic Jewish relations, explaining, I don't think he should be honored because he converted out. Aaron, however, still considered himself to be a Jew, saying, until the Messiah's coming in glory, the Jew remains and he remains a Jew, whether he is Christian or not. His insistence that baptism did not make him abandon his Jewish condition makes many Jewish leaders, including the former chief rabbi of Britain uneasy, who wrote, what greater posthumous victory can we give our enemies than to cease to be Jews? The war's end required an assimilation back into Jewish communities because the children's identities did not belong to them alone. Analysis of hidden child memoirs illustrates that their identities were neither natural nor simple and their religious crises continue to compound their sense of identity. Holocaust survivors might struggle with the questions of theodicy, but the case of hidden children is distinct from camp survivors in one crucial way. Those Jews who had been arrested and deported no longer had a reason to hide their Jewishness. And while they may have lost faith in God during the Holocaust, the change in their relationship with God did not have to do with the indoctrination of a new religion. Hidden children also struggled with God's role in the Holocaust, but their memoirs are preoccupied with the need to reconcile a religion that tied them to their heritage and their parents with a religion that saved their lives. Odette Myers expresses the inner conflict that hidden children lived both during and after the war saying, you're a bad Catholic because you're a Jew. You're a bad Jew because you're Catholic. Neither religion is entirely comfortable. Unlike crypto Jews of more relatively peaceful times, the children didn't always enjoy the freedom that could come with being in a liminal place. Yovel Yeremiyahu argues that a Jew who, quote, abandoning his tradition without being integrated into the Christian world can develop a pe penetrating eye for both worlds and the ability to free himself from their conventions. While the children included in this study certainly possessed a penetrating eye for Catholicism and Judaism, understanding very well the benefits and dangers of declaring membership in each community, they did not have the ability to free themselves from the religion's conventions. As hidden children, their survival depended upon the observance of Catholicism. While the children were living in an overwhelmingly Catholic country after the war, their reclamation by their Jewish community meant the children were expected to abide by Judaism's conventions, in some case to a higher degree than they had before the war. When the hidden children reached adulthood, they found new ways to express their Jewish identity. Rene Lichtman rejects any notion of God, but he found another way of being Jewish, saying, I'm a cultural Jew, yes, with a strong identification with all the Jews who suffered in Europe. As adults, they had the power to select a community. Judaism became something to be chosen, not something demanded by wartime crises or imposed by the post-war Jewish community. Despite years of, un of uneasy assimilation, despite years of living as crypto Jews, 
and despite a strong affinity for Catholic practices, there is a recognition of a common destiny of Jews and a secret link between the past and future connects hidden children survivors to their heritage. From Moses and Esther to Jews in Eastern Europe who are just discovering their familial Jewish heritage after decades of silence. Hidden Jews have struggled to reconcile the contradictions between their heritage and the cultural societies in which they live. The hidden children of the Holocaust uniquely positioned between and within two religions exercise some agency through the negotiation of the categories of Jewish and Catholic in ways that are just beginning to be recognized. Thanks to hidden children bearing witness, we have inherited an expanded canon of testimonies that provide a new dimension to the study of the Holocaust. Too often, when children are mentioned in history, they are written as passive. The study of children's memoirs shows that they were anything but passive recipients, having history acted upon them. Rather, their accounts reveal the religious and cultural negotiations in which they themselves were actively engaged before, during, and after the war, allowing survivors to reassert their voices into the historical narrative. And relevant for, here, for us here today, they are also voices that have the power to bring great value to classroom settings, providing fascinating entry points into discussions of identity, religion, society, and agency that exist among children and youth. Thank you.